In this video, we're going to be going over chapter eight in the text, talking about culture and structure and design of organizations. Now, culture is what I refer to as the sum total of all the behaviors in the, of the people in the organization. If you step back and you're a fly on the wall and you look at what it is that's actually going on in that organization, the way people work, the way they act with each other, the way they communicate, that's all going to be a part of the culture that you see uh, as far as how that organization works. And the things that drive the culture, things like the founders' values, uh, what kind of industry are they in? What kind of culture is that company a part of? So, for example, uh, the culture of a European country is going to be very different than a culture of an American country uh, company. Uh, what kind of vision strategy and what are the, the, uh, the leaders like as far as that culture and that organization are concerned? Culture also impacts the structure as far as who reports to whom and who does what work. Now, when you start thinking about culture, there's basically three levels. You have your observable artifacts. In other words, what are the things that people see that is relating to that culture? What kind of uh, things within the, um, the within the organization? So, for example, um, are you looking at an organization that has a lot of closed offices? Or is it really very open with uh, maybe some low-level cubicles, things like that? Espoused values are the values and norms that they say, this is what we are about. Now, espoused says what you mean, okay, what you say. These are the things that we say that are our values and our norms. You also have what's called values and use. In other words, what are the things that are actually done? as far as that organization is concerned. And then you have the basic assumptions. What are the core values? In other words, do you have a core value of treating people with respect? Uh, customers come first, things like this. When you start looking at culture, there's going to be basically four different types. You have your clan, your adhocracy, your market, and your hierarchy. Your clan culture has much more of an internal focus and a lot of collaboration between the people. The adhocracy has much more of an external focus, and they're very adaptable and quick to make changes. A market culture is fo focused more on the external environment, in other words, what's happening outside the organization, and they're driven by much more competition in trying to get results and, uh, and profits. A hierarchy culture has much more of an internal focus and really is focused in on control and structure, things like that. When you start looking at the different values and things, think about going this way. If you are talking about over here, all right, you're talking about all internal focus. As you move this way, you get much more of an external focus until you get all of an external focus. On the y-axis, going up and down, down here at the bottom, you're looking at much more complete stability and control. The more you move up, the more flexibility and discretion you're getting. So when you talk about more stability and an internal focus, that's much more of the hierarchy. Think about U.S. government. More stability, but a lot of flexibility is more of the clan. Less, less uh, differentiation, okay, and an external focus with more stability and control is much more market. And then the adhocracy is um, high external focus and a lot of flexibility. People learn culture from various things. You have symbols, all right? So, for example, you might have uh, people who have particular pins that they wear on their lapels. Stories, as far as maybe the founder did a particular thing. Heroes, who actually kind of embody the values. In other words, so-and-so came in and saved the day. Rites and rituals. 
many sales organ types of organizations have lots of those uh, at the uh, yearly sales a meeting where all the salespeople are getting together. They might be handing out various awards and things like that. That's all part of the rites and rituals that go along with it. And then you have the socialization. In other words, what's actually happening in the training and the reinforcement that goes along with the various values and the culture. When you start thinking about culture and the impact on the organization, first of all, culture matters. It really does, because it really does impact how people feel about the organization and the way the organization works. And there were several other things that were in here, and this is all in the text, but I thought that these two are really kind of key. Financial performance is not strongly related to the type of culture. You can still have great financial performance, whether you're in a clan, a market, adhocracy, whatever. Companies with market cultures tended to have more positive organizational outcomes. Organizational outcomes could be profit. It could also be customer service, customer uh, satisfaction, things like this. There's a lot of ways that you can start to change the culture. The thing is, it is not easy to do, and it takes time, and it takes effort, and it takes holding everyone accountable for what it is you're trying to do. Many times, senior management will start with a change as far as the mission or the values of the organization. They might put things up on the wall. Those are the language, the slogans, and the sayings that go along with that, that they put up on the walls. They may have some new rites and rituals that go along with it, and stories that reinforce that change as far as the culture is concerned. You can also change the culture through the design of the organization and the way the company is actually seated. In other words, who sits where? What kind of offices do you have? What kind of rewards and titles are actually being out there? What kind of measurable activities are actually being stressed as far as the organization is concerned? Now, there's basically three types of organizations. We've talked about this before. You have your for-profit, not-for-profit, and your mutual benefit. For-profit, they're trying to make money. Nonprofit, they're trying to satisfy society somehow. Mutual benefit is where you're trying to make profit and satisfy social th needs at the same time. The different elements of the organization that kind of pull it all together are things like a common purpose. Everybody focusing, focusing in on the reason for being for that organization. And then they're all working together towards that common purpose. You have a division of labor. You have different people who are focusing in on different things within the work. And then you have a hierarchy of authority. In other words, you know who your boss is and your boss knew, knows who his boss is, etc. There's other things that are necessary also. You need to agree or have an idea as far as what the span of control is. The span of control is how many people actually report to a particular, uh, particular boss. Now, the span of control can be very narrow for things that are very creative or um, things like uh, uh, if you're talking about like architecture, you will have just a few architects that are report to a manager. It can be very wide. If you have something where all of the jobs are really very similar. So, for example, maybe you're in manufacturing. You could have maybe 20 or 30 people reporting to you if they were all doing the same thing. Then you have the idea of authority, accountability, responsibility, and delegation. What that is saying is authority is basically you have the authority or you, have, you can make a particular uh, decision. Accountability is saying, okay, you've made the decision, now you're accountable for that. You have to, you have, if something goes wrong, you're the one they point fingers to. If something goes right, you get the rewards. Responsibility is having to follow through on a particular task. Delegation is passing work down through the organization. Now, one of the things I always learned was you may have the authority to make a decision, the accountability still relies on the people above you. If you think about it, the president of the company delegates down the authority to make various decisions. 
and that may go down multiple levels through the organization. The thing is, who is it that is ultimately accountable for the results? It's the president of the organization. So I've always heard that you can delegate authority. You cannot delegate accountability. Then you have to think about the centralized versus decentralized authority. Who is it that's actually making the decision? How far down would you allow it to go? Now, the simplest structure is what typically happens in organizations that are just getting started. So you're talking about entrepreneurs. The entrepreneur will start a, start a business and possibly hire somebody to work there. Okay, this is the organization chart for my family. Here's my wife, and here I am. All right. What typically happens then is an organization will expand. As it grows, it has a tendency to be to grow in a functional type of organ into a func functional type of organization. So, for example, you have the entrepreneur. OK, and the entrepreneur says, OK, I need somebody who's going to be doing marketing. I need somebody who's an expert in finance and they will hire people to do those functions. The organization continues to grow and those people will hire other people to help with some of those things. So typically what happens is an organization starts with a simple structure and as it grows, it tends to go into a functional type of organization, a functional type of organization is really focused more on efficiency. How do we make sure that things are done efficiently? Companies can also be set up as more of a divisional type of structure. Now you have different types of divisions, okay? You could have product or customer or geographic. There's all kinds of ways of doing it. What typically happens there is you're taking the idea of profit and pushing it down a level. And you may set it up so that in this case, uh, as far as a product division, so in other words, motion pictures, music, magazines are being set up. Maybe it's by customer. So you have consumer loans, mortgage loans, business loans, or maybe it's by geography, Western, Northern, Southern, things like that. Again, one of the things that going to more of a divisional structure does is it pushes some of the authority and everything down a level so that in the functional organization, the only person who's responsible for profit is up here. Because if you think about it, marketing is responsible for bringing stuff in. Uh, finance, production, they're responsible for expenses. The only person who sees true profit is up here. And with more of a divisional structure, you're pushing some of that down so that the music division, say, could have was that person is responsible for the profit within music. So with the divisional, it's kind of pushing some things down. So that's one way of doing it. Now, another way of doing it is kind of a mixture. So, for example, when I was at the pharmaceutical company, we were set up primarily functional where you had research, you had marketing and sales, you had uh, manufacturing, things like this. It was primarily functional. The thing is, lower in the organization, they were set up differently. So, for example, within research, they were set up by product. In other words, you'd have different products that go along with that. You'd have different uh, research that was going on. Within the sales organization, they were set up product and then under that by geography. So you can have a mixture as far as how those divisions are actually set up within the organization. You also have what's called a matrix organization. Now, this was actually put together in this kind of a concept through the Apollo program. In other words, putting a, putting a man on, on the moon. Where you have functions where they're responsible for getting stuff done. And then you have a project type of structure that goes this way, where what's happening is the project manager is responsible for getting the, that project and that product out. And they're having to pull in from pull in people from all the different areas to work on that project. The downside of this is everybody has two bosses. 
So for example, if you're this person here, you are responsible to the vice president here, and you're also responsible to the project manager. So that's one of the issues that you have with the matrix structure. The thing is, it works very, very well. So for example, when I was at Hallmark, we were very much in more of a rate matrix structure where we had the various functions and we had product managers who were responsible for utilizing talent in each of those areas in order to get the products out. Then you have kind of a team-based type thing. In other words, everything is done using cross-functional teams where you're pulling together people to a particular product or project from all the various different areas. For example, when I was at Hallmark, I worked on a project where we were putting together a new product and we had people from marketing, we had people from IT, we had people from manufacturing, all together on this project team in order to get this new product out. You also have what's called kind of a network structure. This is typical of Nike, where the only thing that's within Nike is the design and the marketing. Everything else is outsourced out. All of the manufacturing, all of the distribution, things like that are, are farmed out to other organizations. You might also have a kind of a modular structure. There's uh, IT companies that kind of pull together things from various areas to try to put together a project and a product to get out to their customers. You could have kind of a virtual organization, geographically distant, working via email, uh, video conferencing, things like this. When I was at the pharmaceutical company, a lot of the project teams were virtual. I was working with one team that had a component in the United States, a component in Frankfurt, Germany, and a component in Paris. It's really kind of interesting. You also have to think about the contingency of your design. In other words, are you going mechanistic or organic? Are you differentiating or integrating? And you also have to see how does everything link together as far as your culture, your strategy, and how it, the structure works. The difference between mechanistic and organic organization, organizations, mechanistic, very much centralized hierarchy of authority, whereas with the organic, it's decentralized. A lot more rules and procedures in the me mechanistic, specialized tasks versus shared tasks. When you think about mechanistic organizations, think about the government, very mechanistic, very control oriented. You also want to be thinking about differentiation versus integration. Differentiation is kind of pushing portions of the organization apart. Integration is pulling them together. We also have to think about how everything is aligned. The thing to remember when it comes to structure, structure must follow strategy. Strategy has to come first. What is it that you're trying to accomplish? Where is it that you're trying to go? How are you going to get there? Then you figure out what your structure is going to be. The culture will also come about from those decisions that are being made. So those are some of the key points from the chapter. If you have questions, give me a shout.